I'm the chairman of the board of the Stuart Marchman Act Foundation. I want to thank everyone for coming out today to the Mental Health Symposium, which is brought to you by Who is Jay Mental Health Awareness Campaign. Who is Jay is funded through the Jay's Hope Fund managed by the Stuart Marchman Act Foundation. I'd like now to introduce Hank Ashby. Hank and his wife Susan established the Jay's Hope Fund in response to the tragic loss of their son Jay, a young man who suffered with schizophrenia and who gave up on life waiting for a slot on the FACT team in Volusia County. Hank? Good morning, and thank you, Melissa. And thank you for joining us today. This is really exciting. Um, this is our first um, mental health symposium. Uh, brought to you by Who is Jay, and we're really excited that you're here. Uh, we believe that Florida's mental health system is gradually improving, um, and I can tell you, uh, six years ago now when we lost our son, I, I, I felt like the biggest room in the world was the room for improvement in the mental health system in Florida. <laughs> but, uh, you know, o over time things are starting to improve. Uh, we, we just had some legislation passed, which we're excited, um, helps increase services to those impacted by severe mental illness in both St. John's and Putnam County. So that's pretty exciting. That just happened a few weeks ago. and. Um, I wanted to uh, also mention that um, NAMI was a, a huge help to us. I know NAMI's got a table here today. Uh, back years ago when, when we uh, were having the challenges with our son, we, we got tremendous help and support from NAMI, which pro ha had ongoing uh, health services that it, it provided as far as meetings for uh, what they call peer-to-peer -peer and for um, also for uh, families, uh, members that, that are impacted. Um, and it, it provided a lot of education and training. Um, most people um, were pro are probably like us. They were totally clueless about mental illness. And um, NAMI helped us learn and understand. And we were with others who were impacted. And I know some of you that are sitting here today are in the same situation, so um, we hope that will help. And we're, it's been great, the, the help and support we've had from SMA Behavioral, which, which has really grown since, since we were here. We, we now live in South Carolina, but we're very thankful for the help of SMA Behavioral, for SMA Foundation, and all it has done to help improve mental health services in, in this area. So we're grateful for that. Um, my, I know my wife would, would, she really wanted to be here today. Unfortunately, we had a, had a commit, long-term commitment uh, from months ago that she's up in South Carolina. But uh, she and I uh, co-founded uh, Jay's Hope Fund and who, who is Jay, which is administered by SMA Foundation. And we've grown a little bit each year, and this is the very first time we've had an event like this. Uh, and so we are just thrilled that you're here and hope that you'll find benefit from today's sessions and, and be, help, be able to help others who, who are impacted. So thank you very much for coming and I'll turn it back over to uh, Melissa. Oh, one other thing I just wanted to say real quick is uh, Cindy Wysong, Cindy, oh, there you are. <laughs> I just want to thank you. Cindy arranged for this whole day's activities, coordinated this event, and has done a great job, and we're grateful for your help setting up that. I think we ought to give Cindy a big <laughs> You can also support events and other awareness activities like today by stopping by our giving station, which is right outside the doors of this meeting room, or by visiting whoisj.org and clicking on how you can help and the donate tab. 
But before we get to the program, we cannot forget our amazing partners, and we have a lot of them today. St. John's County, the Department of Veteran Affairs, Epic Behavioral Healthcare, Flagler Hospital, St. Augustine, NAMI of Volusia, Flagler, St. John's, SES of St. Augustine Youth Services, SMA Behavioral Health Services, and Janssen Pharmaceuticals of Johnson & Johnson. And a special thanks to Lisa Hill for her work coordinating MindSTRM and the Exenda program for professionals. Now we, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Blake Levine. Blake has quite the story to tell to inspire individuals living with mental illness. He's the author of numerous published books on mental illness and a coach and founder of BipolarOnline.com. Please help me welcome Blake. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for coming today. And I want to start by uh, thanking SMA Behavioral Health. I think they're a wonderful foundation uh, that does a lot of great things in this community. And this was my first time actually here in St. Augustine. And yesterday I got to walk down by the historic area. And I see why so many people love to come here, because it's quite beautiful. And uh, just walking around and seeing all the buildings and the boats, it was really a wonderful experience for me. And I plan on bringing my wife down here some time to spend a long weekend. And I want to especially thank Hank and the Ashbys. Um, I sadly can understand what they must have went through, because to lose someone so close, like a son, there probably is nothing harder. And I want to start, before I go into my story to share in my own life, um, my brother on April 1st would have turned 30, but sadly about two years ago, he passed away from a heroin overdose. Um, and it just shares with me that young people that face issues, whether it be mental illness or addiction, that can be the outcome, that they don't survive. And sadly, when that happens, it takes away from all of us. But there is another possibility and another chance, and I'm here to share my story because uh, mine is one of hope that we can maybe get through these problems that we face, and that maybe if you're working with someone or you have a child or a loved one that faces a mental illness, it doesn't have to end in them hurting themselves or losing their life. So I'm gonna share my story and uh, hopefully inspire some hope and tell you how the long road ended up to a very positive, inspiring place. So it, my story begins uh, as a young man. My parents were very different. My mom had traveled and lived in many different countries with her mother. She met my dad, who was a lawyer. Um, they started to date and lived in New York City. They had a very fast, exciting life. They used to go to Studio 54 and go out dancing. And I can tell you how many celebrities were there. Andy Warhol was there every night, Sylvester Stallone, you name it, whoever was big was there. And uh, there's a funny story that my mom was pregnant. And most women that are about to have a baby are kind of hanging at home and relaxing, but not her. She was out dancing. They say she was the only one with a large pregnant stomach dancing in Studio 54. And the night before I was born, she danced, and then she went to the hospital, and I was born. And uh, she loved having a child, and so did my dad. But sadly, the relationship started to have issues. My dad did drugs. And uh, when I was about two years old, my mom wanted to get a divorce. And my dad was older and a lawyer and had uh, more money and ability to fight than her. And they had this very rough, difficult divorce. Um, my mom ended up getting the full visitation and made my dad very angry. And I was about three years old when we were in New York City, my mom and her friend, and we were walking down the street. My dad and this guy pulled up in a big truck. They jumped out of the truck. They knocked my mom and my friend, uh, her friend to the ground, took me in the car, and at three, I was kidnapped by my dad. I was taken to South Carolina, and even though I was young, I very much missed my mother and seeing her, and uh, it was very painful because, you know, when you're a young child, you want to be with your mom and your dad. Um, my dad did treat me very nicely while I was gone. He didn't hurt me or do anything bad. We'd go fishing and go to Wendy's and do simple things, and it's kind of interesting because many years ago, when a parent would kidnap a child, it was much different than it is today. The law enforcement wouldn't get involved, and they wouldn't come to try to find where I was. My mom was a young girl in her early 20s with very little money, and she really was struggling to, to find me. And she was about to give up living in New York and not having her son. She was going to move with her grandparents. She had hired a detective to find me, and she went into a, lots of places, and as she was about to give up, she went into a preschool, and she walked in with the detective, and she didn't see me and came out. And the detective said, I want to go in one more time. And he went in one more time, 
pulled out a boy with dyed white blonde hair, and it was me, and I said, Mom. And after that, my parents had a really rough time. Um, back then, it wasn't such a big, severe issue, so my dad only spent a short time being arrested. And my mom was fearful that my dad might try to do it again. Next time, maybe he would take me out of the country and she'd never see me again. So they decided to allow me to visit him on the weekends and um, to see her during the week, and I would go back and forth. And you know, this is a child, I think most kids are just developing and starting to make friendships and go to school. I always had this very high level of insecurity because I felt different from what I had experienced. Um, when I would visit my dad, I would do lots of fun stuff, and I loved to play baseball. My first dream was to be a professional baseball player. And about age six, um, I started to say, Dad, you know, maybe we can meet some of the players. So I went to Shea Stadium and I got Daryl Strawberry's autograph. It was so exciting to meet someone that was famous and successful in the sport that I loved. And uh, one day my dad was listening to the radio and he heard that uh, one of the players uh, from the San Francisco Giants was going to be playing one of the teams in New York and they were staying at the Grand Hyatt Hotel. So my dad said, hey, do you want to go down there? I said, yes. So we rushed down there and uh, it turned out all the players were staying at the hotel and I started to get some autographs. That became our hobby every weekend, going and meeting all the sports stars. It expanded after that, meeting other sports like basketball, people like Michael Jordan, Nolan Ryan, Mark McGuire, um, and I loved collecting autographs. I had all this energy and passion. It was really fun. And then I started to get a little older. In a few years, I started to meet thousands of celebrities. The short list is Michael Jackson, Madonna, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Ella Fitzgerald, Paul McCartney, the Rolling Stones, and I loved going around New York and meeting all these fun people. There even was a time I had a friend that worked for a TV station, Mother Teresa was in New York, and she was staying at the Missionaries of Charity in the Bronx, and my friend said, Princess Diana is coming to meet her. So I went up there, and there were maybe eight people, mostly reporters, and Princess Diana came in a car, and I, I tried to get her to sign something. She rolled the window down, and I took a picture, and she signed some autographs. She walked in the mission. A few moments later, Mother Teresa and Princess Diana walked out hand in hand, and to see them together holding hands, my dad took some pictures that ended up in a lot of the magazines. And it was just a wonderful experience to say, hey, I met Mother Teresa and Princess Diana. And I had lots of adventures, you know, collecting all these autographs. I'll tell you a funny story because political season's kind of here and the election's coming up. So President Clinton was in office at the time, and I saw that he would go out jogging. And he would, you know, often leave the White House and sometimes sign an autograph. So I said, Dad, school's ending. Let's go down to Washington, see if we can meet President Clinton when he jogs. So we went down there, we woke up really early in the morning, and this was before 9-11 and all the terrorism stuff, so we get to the White House and we're waiting, and you know, we're outside and you know, uh, we don't know if he's gonna come out. So after about three hours, my dad said, listen, we're leaving, he's not coming. I said, Dad, just give it a few more minutes. So all of a sudden, a car pulls up to the gate of the White House and there's three gentlemen in it, and they said, hey, we're astronauts and we're here to jog with the president, retired astronauts. So I knew he'd be coming in, now I'm hoping he'll jog out, maybe I'll have some security and I'll, ask him for an autograph. So they go inside the White House, and instead, a 20-car motorcade comes out of the White House. I have all this energy, and I put all this effort to get his autograph. So I'm jogging after the car. So I start jogging as fast as I can. I go for about three miles. And they're going in a, they finally let him out in a park, and they're going in a U-shape. So I'm running through the park, and I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I actually said it's a security thing with Linus from Charlie Brown. And I get right up to him, and Secret Service jumps out. They go, kid, it's not going to happen. Get out of here. You're not going to get his autograph. I said, what kind of country is this? You can't get the autograph of the president. So I was a little dejected. On the way back, they have a camera that films the president at all times in case something happens. So they say, what's your name? And you know, what are you doing? I said, my name is Blake Levine. I want his autograph. I go back to the White House where my dad's waiting in the car. I say, Dad, I'm going to be on TV. He said, yeah, sure, son. Let's go home. So we go home. We drive back to New York, make the long ride. And I call my mom and tell her, hey, I'm coming back. She goes, Blake, you're all over television. It's on headline news and CNN that this boy was trying to meet the president, jogging after him, and he got yelled at, and everybody feels bad. Why are they so mean to this little kid? So I'm trying to figure out, like, what can I do? So I had actually met some other people in Washington, like Bob Dole, who was going to run against him. So I call CNN to find out when it's going to air. They say, you're the kid. We want to interview you. You've been on the news all day. So I do an interview, and in the interview, I say, you know, I met Bob Dole, and he was so nice, and I wish I could meet President Clinton. Okay, so my exciting week continues, and I get a call two days later. Hi, my name is D.D. Myers. I'm the White House Press Secretary. President Clinton heard about your story. Can you come down and meet him? Hmm, what can I do on Saturday? I think I'll be there. So Saturday morning, they have an Oval Office radio address, 
And this time I drive to White House, and it's funny, my mom and stepdad and brother, they never care about autographs, but now that I'm in, invited to the White House, they're all coming. I got my mom, my stepdad, my dad, my brother, the whole family. So we get there, this time they let us right in. And we go in, and uh, I got to go into the Oval Office, which was an amazing experience. And I heard his radio address, and at the end I shook his hand and took a picture with him. And uh, when I came out, there were about 20 uh, cameras there. I said, who are you guys waiting for? Someone important. They said, we want to interview you. So they interviewed me, and uh, my mission was a success. I got to meet President Clinton. And at about 14, I wrote a book called OK, Dad, You Can Take the Picture, Young Man's Quest for Autographs of Fame. And it shared all these stories and pictures of meeting these many different celebrities and the adventures. And uh, things looked really promising at that time. I was on Entertainment Tonight and the Maury Povich Show and in the New York Daily News. And I thought that you know maybe this would all lead to something bigger. Um, a little bit later, my mom, who always lived in Marlboro, New Jersey, which was a nice, safe, small community where I had a lot of friends, we were moving from my stepdad's job to Long Island. And I had really high hopes that I was going to make a lot of friends. and. You know, I'd been in therapy for a while, and then I'd be down to earth and kind, and the kids were very mean and abusive when I got there. They'd make fun of me. On the bus, they'd beat me up. Some of them threatened to come to my house. They'd call me horrible names, gay, weird, loser, faggot. You, you name it, they found something to put me down. I started to get really sad and depressed because I was in this new town. I really didn't have any friends. And I was about 15 when it all kind of came to a head. I told my mom, I feel like my brain is bleeding. And she said, what do you mean? I said, my brain, I feel like it's bleeding. And she called her local doctor. And the doctor said, I'm sure he's fine. Just tell him to go to sleep. And I wouldn't go to sleep. Um, and finally, after about four hours, uh, she took me to the emergency room. And at the hospital, uh, she told them about my life and that I'd written a book and been calling and trying to get on TV shows and all these things. And I guess I was speaking kind of fast at the time. And I'll never forget, they told my mom that I think he might have a mental illness and he needs to stay in the psychiatric hospital. And I just walked up to the psychiatric floor and I was crying and my mom was crying and uh, they put me in a room and I'll never forget her walking out the doors and them locking and my first time being locked in a psychiatric hospital. And within a few weeks I was given a diagnosis of bipolar 1 and they started different medicines trying to figure out what was happening and uh, to stabilize me. At the time, insurance would let me stay for about 30 days, so that's how long I was there. And I came out, but I really wasn't stable. You know, I tried to go back to school, but it wasn't really working out. Over the next two years, I was in and out of five psychiatric hospitals. And it was really such a tough, dark, difficult time, because here I am, a teenager, trying to make friends, and maybe have my first girlfriend, and all these things. And now I'm in and out of all the different hospitals. And uh, really knocked at my self-esteem and my emotions. Um, and it really, we tried all different medicines and treatments and nothing was working. At about 17, uh, we went to this top bipolar expert in New York City and my mom sat with him in my file and all the things that had happened. And I had had some bad things. Uh, one of the hospitals, I thought that the patients were celebrities. There was a redheaded girl, I thought she was Julia Roberts. There was a gay guy, I thought was George Michael. Heavy set guy, I thought was George Kennedy. And even though in real life I had met many of these people, of course this wasn't true. Um, I also had thoughts of trying to learn how to fly, and my parents were worried I would jump off something like uh, the Ashby Sun did. This top psychiatrist sat with my mom and said, listen, uh, I don't think Blake will ever really, you know, completely get better. Just expect him to live forever in a hospital or a group home. He probably won't finish high school or work or have children. And my mom um, really didn't want to accept that. And losing me to a kidnapping as a child, she wasn't ready to let me go again. She kept reading every article and book and magazine and talked to anybody that would listen. And she found another psychiatrist, a woman named Dr. Amy Kareen in Long Island. And Dr. Kareen had a different outlook that maybe I could rebuild my life. And um, she ended up putting me on a new uh, dosage of medicine. And within a few weeks, I started to calm down. And I realized that I basically lost everything. Here a few years ago, I'm in the White House and I'm on television and I'm writing books. and. My life seems so promising, and then I'm in all these institutions, and that could be my outcome. And I wasn't so religious, but I started to ask God for help. And I felt like um, he said, if you go slow and steady, you can rebuild your life. And even though as a teenager, the last thing you do is go slowly, I tried that. And um, I ended up going back to high school at a school for kids with special needs. I finished high school. Uh, I ended up wanting to go to college. I wasn't ready. Some of my friends were going to Penn State. and. Harvard and Columbia and all these other places, but I wasn't ready to leave and go, you know, be in a full-time college and live, so I went part-time while I lived at home. 
I did well, and then I started going full time to college. And then I had all these interests that I had had earlier in my life, and I started to pursue them again. In college, I had a public access show where I'd go to events and interview notable people, and I interviewed Katie Couric and Walter Cronkite and NSYNC and Justin Timberlake, and I really was starting to feel good again about my life. And um, I was living in New York, and on September 10th, 2001, I was on the red carpet for Michael Jackson's comeback concert. It was a really wonderful night. Michael Jackson was there with Elizabeth Taylor, <coughs> Janet Lee, uh, Destiny's Child with Beyonce, and uh, David Hasselhoff, and all these celebrities. I was interviewing them. I thought maybe this is what's going to happen in my life. I'll be an entertainment reporter, and even though I'm mentally ill, I can still do it. And I went to sleep at my dad's on September 10th, and the next morning, I woke up and he was screaming. It was September 11, 2001. And the plane had just hit the towers, and my dad, who's a photographer, he rushed down there to try to go document it for the magazines he works for. And I said, I don't know what's happening. And I left the city. I took my stepmom and sister, and we rushed out to Long Island to where um, my mom lives. And I just felt too scared to go back to New York City at the time. So my mom, who had raised three kids and went through my illness, and she really was fascinated by social work and how people can help others. And she went back to college part-time. She was just about to start graduate school and to get her master's degree in social work to become a therapist. And while she had me at her house, I said, Blake, why don't you come sit in on some classes? You're home and maybe you'll like it. So I started to sit in on some classes and I found it interesting. We were all talking about what happened with 9-11 and how we could help other people and learning about social work. And I started part-time. I really enjoyed it and did well. And then I matriculated into a full-time social work program. I got my master's degree in social work. And during that time, I was in different places. I worked at a mental hospital with kids that had mental illness. Most of them were inner city kids. And they saw me as this kind of white preppy social worker. I thought, how can I connect with these kids? Now, little did they know, since I was a kid, I liked hip hop music. I actually would rap sometimes for fun. So I started to run a group. And the kids were going wild. They were hitting each other. They were yelling. They were screaming and they were listening to the music in the, in the room. So I shut the music off and this big African-American kid says, you a honky. I said, you call me a honky acting silly and acting rude, you better start to respect me, dude. Attitude's ready to say, if you don't stay calm, you'll stay put away, group's over. I'm about to leave, you need to relax and breathe. And the kid's eyes kind of like bulge from their heads. Like, Wait a second, you know how to rap. <laughs> I said, yeah, I do know how to rap. And uh, they said, can you teach us? So I started this technique in 2003 called Rap Therapy, where the kids would write hip hop, song, dance, and art about the things that they went through. And the kids loved it, and to be open, they were able to share about things they couldn't talk about in therapy. In that hospital, they shared about a, a parent committing suicide, they talked about a mom overdosing in front of them from drugs and dying, they shared about what it's like to be in foster homes and to be shuffled into many different ones, and it was really such a wonderful tool. And when I finished graduate school, I said, how can I put the art stuff that I love together with um, this? So I ended up doing a documentary. And I went around, I interviewed 50 Cent and P. Diddy and Russell Simmons and Ludacris and uh, even non-rappers uh, like Anne Hathaway and Tom Cruise. And they all believed that you know, music could be a tool to help kids. And we made a documentary with the Salvation Army in New York. They're one of the largest providers of foster care help in that uh, area. And we did this program where six weeks they learned how to do rap therapy and uh, they ended up uh, having an event where their parents came and watched them perform. And then that documentary went so far that I had never imagined. It was optioned by the producer of the films Dragnet and Face Off and Charlie Bartlett. Uh, we went out to California, which was quite a cool experience, and we met with all the networks, with the Oprah Winfrey uh, Network and Sony and NBC and Disney and Fox. And uh, at one time we had Chuck D, the rapper, we were going to do a TV show where me and him were going to help kids and driving around California with Chuck D going to the presidents of these networks. And I can tell you there's nothing more exciting than going from being a kid in a mental hospital to having these awesome adventures. And I've always loved to write. Um, I had been working as a therapist for a few years. I um, worked at a clinic in New York helping homeless people. We would drive around New York City and look for the homeless and try to offer them services and therapy and resources and I loved that and then my mom opened a therapy practice in Long Island and she asked me to join her and for about eight years we counseled all types of people facing different mental health issues from <clears throat> children to adults people with bipolar schizophrenia uh, depression addictions and I loved helping people and I learned that even though interviewing was a part of what I loved as a therapist you could really help them for the long term and help them figure out how to make different choices and change 
and uh, that's been a big part of my life. And now, not only do I get to travel and do talks, and I've written a number of books, including one called Beating Bipolar. When my brother died, I wrote the book Depression, Bipolar, and Heroin, about addiction and mental illness. And I have two coming out. One is called The Psychology of Adult Coloring, which is those coloring books you see everywhere. So I'm researching that now. And then I have one called The Depression Diet coming out in January. And what I've learned is, you know, we can go through hard times. And with the economy as it is, I would say almost everyone faces times where it's stressful, where it's difficult. But there's always a choice. And to kind of illustrate how I really learned this lesson so greatly, um, I just moved to Florida. I was living in California for a few years, and I missed my mom and family. Um, and uh, we decided to move. My mom was in Boca Raton. So we decided to move to Florida. I just got here. I have a wife who's uh, wonderful, and I'll share a story about her in a minute, but my wife and I have two children. And we got here to Florida, and I was excited to reconnect with my family. I started working at a rehab center with young people with addiction as a therapist, and uh, I was feeling really good. I had just gotten here and was starting my life. My brother is an amazing person. He was very different than me. I'm kind of conservative and quiet, and he is wild and crazy. Uh, just uh, as an example, he loves to go to nudist resorts, which <laughs> takes a lot of guts, right, to walk around naked. Yeah. Uh, and he, uh, he would do all time. He'd go to music festivals and. He, though, when he was young, he was quite short, and he admitted to me that to, when he was growing up, he felt very insecure about himself, and as a teenager, he started to go to parties, and to be able to socialize, he would drink alcohol and smoke marijuana, and this became a very big part of his life. He always loved marijuana, and um, sadly progressed, and eventually he would do club drugs like Molly, where he'd go out dancing and be high at these clubs, um, and he never shared with my family or me about an opiate addiction. Um, though the signs were there uh, later on. So I was living in California, came to visit, I offered to let him live with me, and at the time there were things I didn't realize till later, but he was very sick when he got there. I said, what's wrong? He saw him coming off the drugs, and I'm thinking, if you stop marijuana, you shouldn't be sick. He had some shaking, and he was sweating. Um, I now realize he had dope sickness. Another thing, we had went, he had moved to California hoping to get a job, the job fell through, and that night he said, oh, I'm gonna go to 7-Eleven, I'll be back in five minutes, we're gonna go to dinner. He never came back, and I kept calling him worried he got in a car accident, he basically came back five hours later, said, oh, I went out, what do you mean, we're going to go to dinner? And that to me was a sign that he probably went to go, you know, and get high. Um, so we had a dog that was in our family, a golden retriever named Sammy, who we all loved, especially my brother, and the dog passed away. And on Facebook, my brother put up pictures and seemed very sad and upset. Uh, by what happened to the dog. So he was living in Vermont, working at a ski resort, and um, I was worried about him. You know, he, he, I kept calling him every day for a week, and he wouldn't answer. And on a Saturday, he answered on the first ring. And we talked for an hour, and we joked about all the experiences we had as kids, and laughed, and, you know, he was supposed to move to Florida to be reunited with my mom and our family. And um, I told him how much I loved him and how important he was to me that day, and um, you know, I basically said, I can't wait to see you, and he said, I can't wait, I'll be in Florida with a bucket and some beers on the beach, and just in a couple weeks. And that night he went out with his friends at the ski resort in Vermont um, to the bar, he walked home, and basically uh, he didn't want to drink and drive, so he walked home to his apartment, and he did one needle of heroin, and he fell and died, and his roommate found him the next morning. And I got a call from my mom and, and uh, sister that he had passed. The police came to knock on their door to tell me he had died. And that was it. You know, when someone loses their life, um, there's nothing you can do. You can't go help them. You can't get them into another treatment center. You can't offer them their Their life is over. But I believed that I had a choice. And um, my brother had a non-traditional funeral service at a family friend's house. And people were drinking there. They had beer and alcohol. I had a choice because the truth is I wanted to numb those feelings. I have one brother and, you know, losing him, you're sad and you're upset and, you know, you want to make the pain go away. Something clicked in my head that if I drink tonight at his funeral, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to want to drink again. And then the next day, and it's not going to go away. And if I let his death take away my light and make me an addict, it's just going to put me on that really dark road. So I chose that night silently to not drink. And since he died, I haven't had one drink. 
And what that's allowed me to do, even though I wasn't a big drinker before, maybe I'd have one drink once or twice a month, it made me realize what addicts go through. And I go out to dinner and people are having drinks. Um, or you go to the store and there's beer and vodka and all types of things for sale. And it's everywhere. And I found that as someone that doesn't drink, it's hard. People say, oh, you're at a party. Why don't you have a drink? I was at a wedding. My friend got married. Everybody was cheersing with a beer. And I, I didn't drink the beer. One of my friends said, hey, can I have your beer if you're not going to drink it? And I said, yeah, sure, you can have it. But the point is I realized that for people with addiction, it's hard. And for people with mental illness, it's difficult. You know, I, I have to admit I'm very high functioning, but I work with a lot of people and it's hard to make friends. I was just talking to a young man who came for a session last week with his mom and he sits alone in the house and he doesn't really have friends and he's scared to go out there and meet people. And I told him about uh, the NAMI groups in our area. And I'm sure you guys know about the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I've done a lot of talks with them. They have free groups where you can meet other people. And there's so many people that face these problems and they don't know what to do and they don't know how to get help and they're ashamed and fearful. And when I was young and I got diagnosed, I didn't really see any young people that were surviving and doing well. And I said to myself and to God, if I got through what I went through, I would share my story and I would help other people. And I'm very proud to say we've reached a lot of people. Um, I'm here today and there's a beautiful room. Um, on YouTube, I have almost 600 videos where I talk about these topics. We reached about 150,000 people there. On my website, Bipolar Online, we have keywords that come up on Google. And we've reached people in 150 countries that learn about mental illness. Um, I did a tour with Dr. Drew Pinsky, teaching college students about bipolar. We reached over 2 million people. The teen singer, Demi Lovato, publicly praised my work um, and shared on her Facebook page about the, the efforts. And what I've learned is, you know, there is a groundswell of people that are struggling these days. And I started to write a book about depression, and I feel like all of us, in some way, have some sadness and depression. And when the economy gets tight, it puts pressure on organizations, on families, on couples. But what I have found is we can have hope, and when we look at each other, right, we're here today learning and being together, there's a lot that can come from that. And as much as money is important, it's not the only factor in life. When you share a, a smile, or you hold the door for someone, or you're friendly, or you listen to someone else, uh, it's such a valuable and amazing thing. And I want to share kind of a funny story. No technology, started, right? You're sitting in a room just looking at the person talking, and I would get a sensation in my head when I'm giving the counseling, and it would feel like a tingling in my brain. I'm thinking, this is weird. What is this? And for a long time, I didn't tell anyone. I'm thinking, I don't want to walk around and say, hey, my brain feels really good and tingly. And I started to learn that there's a thing called ASMR. And these are videos people watch, and someone's helping someone else or listening to someone else, and they feel a tingling sensation in their brain. And what I've learned is there's a part of us that feels happy, joyful, and even it might have a chemical release when we connect with others, when we share with others. And I try to teach young people with mental illness that you need that. You need to go around and be with other human beings. You need to make friendships, you need to connect. And these days, you know, there are some great things that are happening. And technology has made so much possible. For example, this video can be on YouTube and people all over the world can watch it. And we could be on our phones and, you know, FaceTime or Skype with someone far away. And we can keep track of all our information. And I am the, have the sloppiest handwriting, but I can type and my books come out and they look perfect because they're printed. But I think that when we use technology, we also have to have human connection. And there's too many young people that stay alone. You know, it's easy to say, hey, I'm just gonna put on headphones or go on the computer and I'm not gonna be in the real world. And I'm not gonna shake people's hands and look people in the eyes. And I think that that's something we have to teach each other is that we can you know, still be around other people. We can make friendships and connections. And that's a valuable piece of the puzzle of living with a mental illness. And I just want to say that you know, it is possible to um, grow and get through anything. And when my brother died, it wasn't just his death that happened. I had some financial issues that were going on and a lot of other things. And I really needed something to kind of hold on through all this stuff. And even though I wasn't so religious, I started to, to focus on God and start to have faith. And I found that's the one thing that got me through. And, you know, I'd listen to positive stuff online, I'd listen to prayers, I'd listen to positive music, and that was my anchor and my crutch. And, you know, I've seen crutches in clients that I've worked with, people 
do gambling or drugs or sex or shopping or money. And those addictions, sadly, no matter how good you feel in the moment, they continually lead you down to a dark place. Um, but the faith that I have, and I'll be honest, I mean, faith is something that we all have different beliefs. I'm not here to say you got to do it this way or that way. But for me personally, having a connection and a relationship with God, it got me through. And I learned that no matter what's going on in my life, um, I have that best friend with me. And when my brother died, he was my best friend. And I lost him. And it made me say to myself, you know what? I need something to help me. And the faith just held me together and pulled me through. And it's funny, my brother never met my son. My son was born around the time my brother died. And now I have a two-year-old son, Ryan, and you know we hang out every day, and my wife falls asleep about 8 o'clock, and sometimes he's on the couch with me, and we're watching Full House, and I'm there snuggling with my little two-year-old son. And I realize life is good, and these are the moments that really count and matter. I have a daughter who's seven, and she's so beautiful and fun, and we have a great time hanging out together, and I take her to Toys R Us on Friday to get a little gift, and we go get ice cream, and... I have a wife that I've just celebrated in April, uh, 10 years of being married. I'll tell you a funny story. You know, I've always done this entertainment stuff, and that was always a dream in my life. So I had heard they were looking for relationship stories for Valentine's Day for Dr. Phil. So I wrote in and figured it was a long shot that they'd call. Well, they ended up calling, and they said, oh, we you know, heard about your story. And I said, but we need something kind of like juicy because you can't just like surprise her and do something positive. Okay, so I told her that my first girlfriend had cheated on me a number of times and I was scared to get married because my parents had a rough divorce and because of the first girlfriend. So I said, all right, well, we want to you know, share your story and maybe have you meet Dr. Phil. So I was living in New York at the time and um, I went, uh, they came to my house and they said, we want to show your journey. I'm thinking, what do they care about? So they're filming in my house, they're filming getting in a taxi, they're filming going to the airport. When I got to the airport in LA, they said, we want to film you leaving the airport. I said, okay, so I'm in... I get out of the airport, there's one little camera filming me like there had been in New York. As I walk out of the LA airport, there's like 30 lights and cameras and cranes, and it looks like a movie. So I'm thinking, what's going on? So yeah, just walk into the taxis. Okay. So I walk into the taxi, and I'm from New York originally, and we have foreign taxi drivers that wear hats and often don't speak English. So I get in the taxi, and there's the taxi driver with the hat, and he turns around. It was Dr. Phil driving the taxi. And he said, I hear you get nervous, pop in the question, get ready for the ride of your life. <laughs> so he's driving the taxi. Now I figure out why they had all the lights and everything because he was there. So they said, we're going to take you to a restaurant. We want you to have dinner and talk about things. So we go to this restaurant and there's four cameras and lights and me and Dr. Phil are having dinner. And I'll be honest, I couldn't eat a thing. I'm so nervous. Right? I'm sitting here. He's a little intimidating. So we start talking and you know he asked me questions and I told him about the girlfriend that had cheated and my parents divorcing. And he said, well, you can't you know, blame another girl for your, you know, Jennifer, you got to decide, are you ready to get engaged? You know, do you feel comfortable? So we had this whole dinner, and so think about it was the way they left it. So a day later, I realized I did want to get engaged, and um, they said, all right, well, we're going to bring Jennifer out to California. I said, okay, that's great. I miss her. Let's bring her out. So they said, we need a cover story to figure out how to get her to the Dr. Phil show without her realizing she's going to get proposed to on national television. So I had done these documentaries, like the Rap Therapy one, and the cover story was that we were gonna, MTV was gonna maybe buy Rap Therapy and, and give me a, a million dollar deal. And they wanted my girlfriend to be there to come to the award ceremony. So my, Jennifer sucks, and said, you're finally getting your break, you've been trying for years and years, finally something good's gonna happen. So she flies out to California, and I said, you know, MTV is owned by Paramount, and Paramount owns Dr. Phil. I know you like this show. Do you want to go sit in the audience before the MTV thing? They have some extra tickets. You know, yeah, sure. So she goes to the Dr. Phil show. Now, they put on a microphone on her and stuff, and she says, it's going to be for MTV later, but just put it on now. And I would have been questioning, why am I wearing it, or what's going on? Or, okay. Now, I'm backstage, and I'm so nervous, and I'm thinking, I have a wedding ring. How do you get engaged without a wedding ring? So I just said, guys, I don't have a wedding ring. They said, don't worry. I think I'm about to get it proposed on national television. I'm a little. They said, don't worry, it's all going to work out. Okay, so I go out on the stage and I sit with Dr. Phil and he shows some footage from 
um, the dinner, and uh, he says, so are you ready? I said, yes, I'm ready to propose. He goes, well, I have a surprise for you. He brings out a Beverly Hills jeweler, donated four rings. Uh -huh. And he said, pick one. And one was kind of the style that she had liked, so put it, he puts it on his finger. He goes, oh, it's pretty nice. I said, sorry, Dr. Phil, I'm going to marry Jen, not you. He started laughing. <laughs> um, so now I'm sitting there. He goes, all right, Blake, we're going to bring her out. Do what you want to do. So I'm standing on the stage, and I'm a little nervous today, you know, coming here and talking, but I've done a lot of talks. But being a, on national television, B, about to propose. I don't think I've ever been more nervous in my life. I'm trying to help, you know, by shaking. So she comes out, and I try to be nonchalant, like I'm, I always try to do. And she comes, she goes, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm just doing a little taping. So she walks up. I said, Jen, I've loved you since the minute I met you. I want to spend my life with you. Will you marry me? And she just falls and gives me a hug. And Dr. Phil walks over. And, so Jennifer, was that a yes? <laughs> she says, yes, I love him, and I want to spend my life together, and I want to get married. And that was about 11 and a half years ago. We've been married 10 years. And you know, the whole adventure that I've had, it makes me believe that there can be a positive outcome. And you know, I've been through a lot in my life. I'm 37, but I feel like I've lived maybe longer than just 37 years. But we can have positive outcomes. And I've had the opportunity to go do talks in probably about 40 cities, mostly NAMI and DBSA groups. And I see young people and adults that are out there trying. And you know what? Some are out there working. Some are having careers. Some are even having families. Some are not. Some are at home, and they're trying to just get through day by day. And they're trying to hang on there. And the families have a lot of pressure trying to support them and help them. And my belief is wherever someone is with a mental illness, they should be thankful that they're alive, thankful that they're connected. Even if family is the only connection they have, that can be such a vital piece. And there is the chance that anyone with a mental illness can go out there and do what's in their heart. And I like to share my story because it is kind of a crazy adventure, but there's a lot of hope in it. And if I could go out there and write books and get engaged and be married and have kids and share my story all over, it tells me that other people that have dreams, maybe someone wants to be a teacher, be a social worker, a fireman, a policeman, and they want to do something positive with their life, they should still go out there and try. And one of the biggest things for me was after I started to get stable, I didn't want to live at a level that was not what I wanted. And I started to say, you know what, I could still go out there and pursue my goals and my ambitions. And I went slowly, and it didn't happen overnight. You know. I'll be honest, I just I have two books coming out. The first book that got published by a major publisher, it took about 15 years to actually get accepted. I had lots of times with agents and trying, and it never worked. <laughs> so nothing in the story that maybe sounds glamorous or exciting it didn't happen easily or overnight. And um, like everybody else, I face real stress and pressure, whether it's paying the bills or, you know, I watch my kids most days and have to care for them. And I've learned that nothing in life is easy, but if you have faith and you take small, slow steps, you can get stronger. And even if you don't live with a mental illness, to get up there and Cindy to come and put this all together and do a great job, and everybody at this organization that's worked so hard to help others in the community, it is such valuable work. And I think we all should thank you for the efforts you put in to caring for other people. And I've learned as a social worker, I've had you know, young people I work with, and they say, what do you mean? I don't want your help, or leave me alone. And it's sometimes thankless. You're trying to help someone. They need the help. You know, I've had parents come to me and say, I'm doing everything I can for my son, for my daughter, and they yell at me, or they are aggressive, or they put me down. But that effort that the families put in, and the people that help in the community, it is so vital. And in my own life, if my mom didn't stand by my side and keep pushing and keep pressing, there's a lot of ways along the road I could have given up. And I just want to take another moment to thank Mr. Ashby because, you know, after my brother died, I wanted to kind of just hide and kind of say, you know what, this is too hard. I can't share about him. I remember the first time I talked about how am I going to look a group of people in the eyes and admit that my brother died and that he overdosed. But I, I believe that God wanted me to share his life. And even though he's gone, that his example maybe could touch someone else's. I believe their son, even though he's not here today, in a way he's with all of us. And he's helping to reach people in this community, and there's more to be done. And as we all are here, and even though I maybe am going to go back to Cooper City, you are in this community, and you're impacting lives, and you're reaching others. 
and we can walk out of here making a difference in someone else's life. And if we can prevent one young person from taking their life, we've made a big part of doing something positive. And it's not always easy. It's not always exciting. But it's real work that many of us are committed to doing. And I think we can do that and come together. And um, we are all one. That's one of the greatest lessons I've learned. Many times we feel our own problems, our own experiences. We're different. We have our issues. We are all one community. It doesn't matter your age, your race, your background, your financial status. We are all people trying our best to survive. And when we come together and help, we make a difference. And I've learned you know, working from people that are homeless all the way up to people that are billionaires and celebrities, there is no difference. We all have problems. We all have struggles. We all have adversity. And uh, I'll leave you with one thought. I was working with a coach. His name is Randy Spelling. And his dad is Aaron Spelling, who created Charlie's Angels and all these things. And I, I was young. I used to think, wow, his life must be pretty good. He grew up in this manor mansion that was this massive estate. And he was friendly with all these famous people. And I, I hired him to be my coach a couple of years ago. And we worked together. And he said his greatest lesson was that no matter where you are, don't try to walk in someone else's shoes. You know, he saw all these people that seemed to have so much. He said, and behind the scenes, it's so much different and so much harder, and there's so much struggle. And even Randy, when his dad passed, didn't leave him any money. And he, he's out there as a coach living in a small place trying to survive and help people. And it made me realize that nobody has it any better. Nobody has it perfect. And you may look at others and say, oh, they have this or that. Focus on your own journey and do the best you can. And, you know, in recovery, they talk about one day at a time. And that's one of the greatest lessons I've learned. I don't know how I'm going to be a dad for the next 20 years and pay for college and handle this. I don't really know. But I know today I'm doing the best I can. And I'm going to try to have the best possible day and be kind and helpful and warm to anyone I encounter. I'm going to thank God for letting me be here, letting me share my story. I'm going to do the best I can today. And even if you're not in recovery, that idea of what can I do today, what can I do to the best of my abilities in this moment? That's something that we can all work on, and it gets us to maybe have an awesome day. So thank you so much.